Well, I'm going to say good morning again because that's what he wants on this thing for us to say good morning to one another. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we were on. Uh, we were on uh, this week. We were on the disciples, appearance of disciples, and we spent most of our time talking about him and the Holy Spirit because we got a little bit uh, caught up on 23 and 22 about the spirit and uh, when they received the spirit. So we see that he, uh, Jesus had breathed on uh, on the disciples and told them to receive the Holy Spirit, but it wasn't. Uh, and as we can see here, uh, John has did this for the first time. Uh, what's the little asterisk mean? I didn't even look that up last. Uh, the asterisk says something about this. The asterisk refers to what it's... The action recalls Genesis 2-7 when God breathed on the first man and gave him life. Just as, Adam came, just as Adam's life came from God, so now the disciples. New spirit comes from Jesus. So the revocation of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37. This is the author's version of Pentecost. Mm. The author's version of Pentecost. Okay. All right. So... To me, what we see is that Jesus, for the first time, breathes on the disciples. So this isn't the first time they received the Holy Spirit, but we'll get to when in Acts when they receive it and they get all excited. But I think he he did it to everybody. We talked about that, right? He did it to everybody when he was um, uh, when when we come to Pentecost, which is going to come last Sunday in May. Oh, right. Late Sunday in May, he's going to do that. So, so now we're on. Uh, the, we should be on um, John uh, Thomas. How he reveals himself to Thomas. Anybody got any comments on this week? Okay. So we still got another whole page to do before we finish this, and um, uh, we finish next week. So as I was telling uh, Kathleen earlier. When we finish uh, uh, this, uh, Father wants to finish up this um, chapter on on uh, on John, so we can move on in September. And then when we finish this, John, then we'll go. We'll take a break, and uh, we won't we start until September. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. When is the last class? Uh, when we finish John. And that could be next week. It could be the week after. Depends on how long we stay on this these topics. You know how long we uh, stay on one paragraph. <laughs> now yeah. I thought we were starting on twenty one. The appearance oh. to the seven disciples. No, we're starting on um twenty four. Twenty four. We finished um twenty one. We didn't finish Thomas. Uh, we didn't do Thomas. No, we just finished. Thomas is coming up. Yeah, Thomas is coming up. If somebody wants to read that, we'll start with Thomas and read down to, wait a minute, yeah, 29 is when we end it. So we're going to read the whole thing on Thomas, and then we'll get a conclusion. And But I don't know why he said that, that Father, we had to go back and do one of those Father Rich numbers. They put a conclusion at the end of Thomas, and then on then there's another whole page where he <laughs> meets disciples again, and then he puts another conclusion. So it's like... Um, <laughs> White is, uh found this later and it's like okay oh well we left this out let's put this at the end i think that's what they did instead of putting it right here where they should have put it they concluded and then they put it there at the end i whoever put this together did that and we already know it wasn't john right they're writing about john right. it's john's writing but the disciples his disciples wrote this is that on paper am i right right okay that's what we thought Okay, let's read about Tom, and then we can have comments on uh, what we read. So we read 24 to 29. And somebody want to jump on out there? I'll read. Oh, thank you, Catherine. I've been waiting to jump over each other. <laughs> I'm going to meet everybody except for Kathleen. Okay. Thomas okay. called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. 
So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger, finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Amen. Amen on that one. Let's take a minute uh, and uh, see what y'all, what you find out is interesting and this uh, section here about Thomas. What jumps out at you? My favorite part of this reading is at the end when he said, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. None of us have seen Jesus in person and yet we believe. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's a very familiar story. I found story. it interesting you know? that. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just saying it was a very familiar story. You know, we, it's. I know. I know this one. <laughs> okay. I found it interesting that he should be with his. That Thomas should be with his disciples all that time. Uh, through Jesus's teaching and he doesn't even believe his own peers when they all went through the same experience with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think Thomas is sort of like we are. I mean, if, if, you know, we've been with someone, they passed away and then they said, we've seen them again. And like we said, you know, I need proof. So Thomas, put your finger here in my side. And so what they say, I think we said seeing is believing, something like that. Absolutely. And so I, I think we're like that sometimes. It's like, unless I see it for myself, I ain't gonna believe it. You know, that's my comment. Yeah. I agree, and I think that also um, for us, like us that are on this Bible study, we don't see, but yet we believe. And the question that I ask, why do we believe? And I think that if we, as far as I'm concerned, I believe in the gospel. That's the only thing really I have. And someone like you all sharing your information uh, with me. I was not, I was very serious and, and I want to thank my sister at this time for bringing me to Bible study, but this is the first Bible study I've ever been on. And I was raised a Catholic. I went to Catholic school. I never went to Bible study, but through this class, for some reason, I feel even more drawn into the gospel. And I want to thank you all for that. And that's what this reminds me of, that I don't have to, I, I don't see, I mean, and, and people I know are going to come across in my lifetime that are going to ask me questions that I feel like I'm now comfortable, able to answer. Um, that is great. Amen. That is really great. And that's in one of the purposes about having Bible study, um, to understand. And, uh, and also it helps you with your faith. Why do you, you know, especially black Catholics, the question I hear, why do you want to be a black Catholic? Mm -hmm. They hear so much negative stuff in the news about us, especially lately with the priests. How can you believe in a, in a religion that has so much a bad stuff going on? But it's not just us. It's just that uh, we are 
this church is so large that it it just puts focus on it. But it happens in small communities. It happens everywhere. It's not just just you know just us. It's just the fact that we're larger. We're everywhere and yes. we're all the world, basically. And they and they have done this and put this all over the world. So people want to know why do you want to be a Catholic? Mm-hmm. And that's a, that is a very good question for me, who is um, who was born a uh, Protestant, uh, you know, who grew up and raised Protestant, decided to be in this church. I think God put me here. He brought me here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. He put this woman in my life who just nagged me to death, who I didn't want to do anything, Virginia Pilot, nagged me to death about being on her evangelization team, which I didn't want to be because I didn't understand. But sometimes when you don't understand is when you should jump in. And that's what Garnetta did. She didn't understand. But I want to tell you all before I get started is that I love Catholics. I mean, I love you all because, no, you didn't have Bible study, uh, Garnetta. They didn't do Bible study. They just yeah. starting um, after Vatican II just to open up. And yes. if you go around to different churches, they're starting to do Bible study, but not as much as we're doing Bible study. So, you know, we are lucky. We are blessed. We're lucky. And we're trying to understand um, what God wants of each and every one of us. Today, we have uh, 12 individuals on this line. And and we're still asking the question, each and every one of us, you know, I believe, but what is it you want from me? And we're trying to understand that. Every week when we get on here, we try to understand. But for those Catholics, I say to you, <laughs> God has blessed you, graced you, because most Catholics believe and had not seen or had not even read a scripture. They heard it from the, from the priest. Yeah. Right. The priest did something bad, but it doesn't mean that because he did something bad that he did not pass the word on to you. He, mm-hmm. You didn't capture, you captured the word from him, and y'all read the catechism. Yes. To me, yeah. To me, y'all smarter than a whole lot of people, and y'all don't think y'all are. Y'all know the Bible, but you act like you don't know it, and you do. If you read the catechism, it tells you every way you need to go. If I Not now, really. And- it just points yeah. out what the church believes. Mm-hmm. We were not encouraged to read the Bible as, as a child and growing up. Right. Re- remember... Remember, we had the conversation before around this, and yes. and pretty much the the church teaches the Catholic teaching, but we hardly get into relationship with God. Remember, we had that conversation before, yeah, I and, and I think settings like this is now drawing that out. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not so much the teachings of the church, so to speak. Not that that they're not important, but yeah. we need both and or all, all including, but. The church, and I remember as I was growing up, it was more about the Catholic teaching, the catechism, but not so much the relationship with God, you know, and, and I'm going to say it this way. When I was little, it was more like the priest was God. And, and you know, we, we gave reverence to the priest, you know, and not knowing, I mean, if you come through and don't discover for yourself, then that's where you get bound at. Right. And I think somebody said we weren't even reading our Bibles or bringing our Bibles. No. Nope. And it's yeah, like, we how do we know about the God unless we find out for ourselves? I mean, we sit, we come to church on Sunday, you go to Sunday school, but what more are you doing beyond that? This is when I was little yeah. and coming forward. So I'm so glad but, that. But, that but you believe, but yes. you didn't believe. Huh? The thing is, the thing about Catholics is you believe what the priest said. So you heard the word and you believed it. You went home and your families prayed. Reinforced it. Mm -hmm. And reinforced what you believe. Now, the relationship is what the church is now trying, you said the church is trying to get that relationship. And it was shocking to me when I told you I went to one of these meetings and I think it was me, Regina, uh, Beverly, and uh, Denise went to this meeting, and Father Rich, and they talked about uh, now we want to form a relationship with, with uh, you know, with God. And I'm saying relationship. And I stood up and I said, well, I'm confused. Because in the African American church, we always look for a relationship with God. Our, our being is part of a relationship with God. 
even if we hadn't seen him, we know that we have a relationship. But what? but he told me that no. even a lot of the priests, the deacons, they had no relationship with God. Yeah. They no. had no they they gave it to us, but we created a relationship, but they created none. And that was totally shocking to me. I said, how can you believe in something that you don't have a relationship with? Exactly. A relationship, D, is like you're married. Yeah. Yeah. Someone you talk to on a daily basis. Someone right. you trust. Someone, a lot of people put God on a pedestal and we weren't supposed to talk to him just any old time except when we pray. Um, a relationship is different. We right. talk everything, anytime. Not necessarily when we sit down to pray. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is back in those days, Michael will agree, I guess. He was born sometime back there. You weren't allowed in the rectory. You, when you go to church, all you saw was the back of the priest. Because he stood backwards. Mm -hmm. And he preached. He read the readings and he preached. So that's why we held him at high esteem. He was greater than God as far as we were concerned. Right. And Wouldn't sometimes he... in Latin. Exa oh, in yeah. Latin. Exactly. And we couldn't mm -hmm. go see him. It was but, in... but, but, but y'all have to say but. Y'all <laughs> still believe in God. Y'all still believed in Jesus. Y'all still went to church every Sunday. Y'all still went there even if it wasn't Sunday. Y'all went to church. Well, that was all we knew back then. But you still, it started with belief. You yeah. still believed. Yeah. You were like the disciples here who he came in and number two, and he he believed. They told Thomas, Thomas didn't believe. Thomas did not believe. He, because he was just like Michael said, he's like us. We have, we think we need to see the, and there's still a lot of people like that. They don't believe in Jesus because they haven't seen him personally. Or because he didn't answer their particular prayer. <laughs> or to ask their particular prayer. And you're right. And, and come to me again. Have you not seen Jesus? Tell me you haven't seen him. I don't believe that we haven't seen him. Now think about, I'm going to take a minute and think about when you've seen Jesus in your life. If in your life or someone you know, your children or somebody, when have you seen Jesus act in your life? We see him in the beauty of, of nature. Mm -hmm. You see him in your life experiences, supernatural that some may be, but it's that you have to develop that uh I'll say belief, because in that development, I then can see him or what we call his glory manifested in many ways. But, but that takes a development of, of our mind, of our belief system. So yes, he's present, right? And we, I don't know about y'all, but I've seen some phenomenal things and, and I attribute it to that. And, and I'll just add this and then I'll stop. I was looking at uh, one of the reflections last night, actually it was for today, and it talked about heaven. And it said, heaven is not necessarily in the sky, but it's the spiritual presence, right? And so I like that chocolate cake, mm, I'm in heaven, <laughs> right? That, that spiritual experience of something greater than what I am. So I'll leave it at that. I agree with that 100%. And I love chocolate. I want you to know. <laughs> oh my God, chocolate. But yes, like Michael said, I don't know where heaven is. I don't have any idea. We've always been told is up above the sky that we see and know. Right. However, the thing is, we feel things happen in our lives that we feel Jesus just like he's sitting right beside us. I, I, I used to have a room back in the day where I prayed, said my prayers. And the, the, the instructions that I was reading 
was telling me to look and act like I am talking to Jesus when I'm praying. And when you do that, honestly, you get a certain feeling that he is, in fact, right there. And it I, says, use your imagination, right? All, all of that is God-given. God-given. Right? Uh, when we did a class with Dr. Stanley, and we had to create a mask ourselves, I've said this a million times, if it wasn't for Jesus just opening this Bible, telling me where to turn to, I didn't know where to turn. I just opened it and boom, there it was, my whole mass. I think that, um, you know, the reason I ask this question because we have seen the Lord, it says in 25. And we have seen the Lord. We have seen him. Um, Michael mentioned that many miracle things. We also see him in uh, how he... Um, saved our children uh you know how you know when we said the name of jesus he shows up I, i'm saying that we have seen him and we've seen him act in, in the whole lot of ways that these people when we read john did they seen him we might not have seen the physical of him but we've seen him we've seen his actions we've seen him actions in our own life you know when we sit there and pray and we believe and and we pray instantly with our whole being, Jesus shows up. And he shows up in so many different ways that we can't even put our finger on it, but he does. And to say that we haven't seen him is, is belittling, belittling us or belittling Jesus. He said, because we have seen him. And if you think about it, you know, you start, you know, if you stop and think about it, you have seen him in so many ways. You know, I, I tell the story all the time. Um, you know, when my son died, he was there. He was there. They lifted me up so that I felt that I was being caressed and I wasn't put down on, on this ground because so I felt like I was walking on air until he felt like I was ready. I was I was ready. And when he was put down, when I felt like I was ready, he put me down. And I could feel the presence of God leaving me when that happened, you know, to me. So I'm just saying. We have seen the Lord in our life. You know, he might not have been physical. That I can touch him just like this, but I know that I've seen him. If I've seen him in a vision standing beside me, I've seen him working with my children when I pray to him, and I know that you all have seen him too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this group. You would not be in this group. If you did not believe it wouldn't be Loretta praying in the prayer earlier about the children that was at the funeral that she was at before. Because if we know Jesus, and, and, and I was at a funeral like that before too, and I was told if we really know Jesus, we don't actually we lost somebody like that that way. We don't, we don't. And you know, from then on, I started watching people at funerals, I really did. It is different when you know Jesus. The people react differently when you know who Jesus is. They know they're going to miss the loved one that's gone in that box, but they know that that person is with Jesus, is with God, but also with us. Because we know that as long as a person, as long as we speak that name, and we're doing it now at prayer, as long as you speak their name, we put their name up on the list of prayer when it comes up, how many, how many years or whatever they, they've been gone, they are still alive in their hearts. We may not see them physically, but we know that they're still alive in our heart. And we remember the things that they did. We still talk about the things that they did, the things that they made us smile, even the things they made us mad about. We still talk about it. And that's what these we have in common with these disciples. Even though Jesus is gone, they are having, they told their disciples, and their disciples is writing it down so that we'll know, we got to know who Jesus is too. And without them, we would be like Thomas. We would have to say, we'd be standing there at the door saying, unless I see him and I put my hands in the nail holes and his hands in his side, then I'll know that's Jesus. Is that us? So we're saying, we're saying that um, while Thomas was walking with Jesus, was he believing when he was physically present before he died and now 
are we saying that Thomas is not believing that Jesus rose or Thomas just didn't believe, period? That's just a question. I don't think Thomas never believed. I think Thomas just didn't believe that Jesus resurrected. He didn't resurrect. He felt he saw him die. He didn't believe he came back. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, I, I'm with you, um, Regina. I believe when he was walking around with Jesus, yes, he believed. Yeah, okay. in ghosts, he believed in all things that he did, but they'd never seen anybody re resurrect. He never knew it was new to them, and so he was. He could not put that part. He couldn't believe. That part of what Jesus was telling him, he couldn't believe. And when they said they saw him, okay, you're grieving. He, he probably thought, okay, you're grieving. And y'all think y'all saw him. But unless I see him personally, I ain't gonna believe nothing that you all said. And then somebody mentioned it earlier. Who is that? Even though his kin, he, um, he's been with Jesus. Well, I think it was uh, Garnetta. Even though he was walking with Jesus and his friend and his his kin, his friends were telling him they saw him. He didn't believe them either. That's right. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, can I read you all something? Go ahead, Catherine. We we okay. we quote this every week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this print is so small, so I'm struggling. But here, okay, it says Jesus wasn't hard on Thomas for his doubts. Despite his skepticism. Thomas was still loyal to the believers and to Jesus himself. Some need to doubt before they believe. If doubt leads to questions and questions lead to answers and the answers are accepted, then doubt has done a good work. It is when doubt becomes stubbornness uh, and stubbornness becomes a lifestyle that doubt harms faith. When you doubt, don't stop there, but let your doubt deepen your faith as you continue to search for the answer. I think that's wonderful. That's a good reading. Um, it, it is a reading. It puts me in the mind of why I'm here. Um, I I didn't doubt, but I did. I need to know more. I remember wanting to know more. Mm -hmm. and, you know, my cousin asked me, so why don't you just believe the priest? I said, I mean, that's nice, but I want to know for myself. And I went, oh, oh, you know, I mean, I, I got all these plaques, all these certificates that I took classes, and I've been all over the city, all over the country, just to find out who this Jesus is. Honestly, maybe I'm telling, maybe I was Thomas. I probably was Thomas that I needed to, to see for myself. And uh, I remember telling myself at the time, I said, I, I felt like I was like Moses, and I went up on the on the mountaintop, and I saw this bush going uh, on fire, and I wanted to know why the bush was on fire and why this God was calling me to him when uh, I could remember not wanting to come. And I could remember not wanting to come, you know, because not because I didn't believe is that I don't think I wanted to, every time I hear following Jesus was like, then I got to take off his yoke. I got to, you know, go through the pain. I said, I don't, I don't thank you. I, don't, <laughs> I said, I'm being honest. I said, no, thank you. I didn't want to do this. And, you know, it seemed like I kept going and doing things that I kept saying I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do youth ministry. You, uh, Eddie Young, the building we named, came to me and asked me, why don't you do youth ministry? And I'm sitting there going, I don't know about that. <laughs> you know, I mean, and then I want to be in it. My here God used my children to say, I want to join a youth group. You know, God can work through other people to get you to do what he wants you to do. Remember Jonah and the whale and the big fish or whatever you want to call it? Jonah said, what? I love Jonah. He said, I'm not going over to Nineveh. I'm not telling these people nothing. I don't want to go there. So he gets on a boat. The boat starts acting up. The people throw him overboard. He winds up in a big fish and he changes his mind. Now, that's not the end of the story. He goes and does, he finally goes and does what God tells him to do. And then God said he's going to punish these people. These people decided to repent and give their life to God, and God forgives them, right? Jonah is pissed. I mean, I love him to death. He is mad. He is mad at God because God 
said, go, I always joke I went through, I go over here and tell these people, they might kill me, that God said, you are a bunch of crap, and you're a devil. And then what happened? Oh, please don't kill me. And then he saves them. As I was through, I was mad. I was along with Jonah. I said, I'm on your side. But you know what? Jonah wound up loving God. God wound up forgiving Jonah. <laughs> you know, it all ended well. But you know, it's still a human development. And that's why I like the story. That's why I like the story. It's a human development. We as individuals, all it's 13 of us on this line right now. We are individuals. And we have to take this relationship. As Kathleen mentioned earlier, Regina okay. mentioned, we have to take this relationship and we have to draw from it. You know, what does God want us to do in this relationship? What does mm -hmm. he want me to do? And if you look through the chapter, we don't read John all the way through. What does God want these disciples to do? Right. Disciples. I guess I have a, I have a question. Um, I believe we talked about on the call a week ago about um, there comes to a point, I believe Father Rich um, talked about this before. Uh, someone brought it up on a call that it comes to a point where um, when, when there are non-believers and, and I'm sure I'm not um, uh, quoting this, but when there are non-believers, they come to a point where you can't spend your time on a person, but for so long, and you move on to the next person. So looking at these verses um, from Thomas, about Thomas, is if he had put his hands, well, he did, he put his hands in Jesus' side before he confirmed um, his doubt. And then, well, not confirmed his doubt, but he sort of um, sort of understood the truth at that point. He believed at that point when he put his hands in Jesus' side. But suppose that he hadn't, and suppose he had put his hand in Jesus' side and he still did not believe. My question is, is how much effort and time do we put on a person who does not believe when we say we should move on because not everybody's going to believe us. When do you, I don't have that sense of when to move on because for me, I would still want to try. I would think that Jesus would still do something else for Thomas to believe because he didn't want to lose him as a disciple. So I guess that's my question. Well, anybody else want to answer that question? I care to answer it. I have a nephew who grew up in the Catholic Church and then he just left. Now he claims he does not believe in God. Hmm. I can't preach it to him. You can't talk them into believing anything. They seriously have to see for themselves. And as long as they know what Jesus or what God is capable of doing, they will see it in their lifetime. Um, I don't believe in trying to talk anybody into anything. I, um, how can I put it? The Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, I know I'm not quoting it correctly, they're telling us, I believe Paul is telling us to preach the gospel, live the gospel. And only in very important times do we have to use words. In other words, we preach the gospel through our own actions, the way that we live. Yes. Yes, I, I agree with you. I don't think you can... Um... God, no, I, I really don't think um, you can keep trying. But you, as Gina said, you try through action. Sometimes words do not say anything, and you may not see it in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. That person might change at your deathbed. You may never see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what God planned for you, maybe, you know, that you may never see it, but maybe you'll see it from heaven. You might not see it on this earth, that that person has changed. 
and and you know, and some people don't change until they get on their deathbed. Yeah. When they get on their deathbed, they are scared. And if you know, if Father Richard tell you if he was here, uh, people uh, do different things when they are about to go on. So you know, like I'm saying, you might see it at his deathbed, or you might not see it in your lifetime. In your but life. I don't think that um, I know that. And that person is threatening you. I think, you know, you you wipe the dust off your feet and keep going. But if that person's not threatening you, you have to show him or her through your, how do you deal with everything in your life through God, through Jesus Christ? I mean, everything. I don't mean, there's nothing that they don't want you to do. If you want, to tra- if you want that person to turn around. I mean, you got to show them how Jesus is with you in death, how he's with you at birth, how he's with you in your everyday life. You have to, how you, you know, your good times and your bad times. You have to show this person every part of your life because that's the only way they're going to believe. And if you change one step away, then they will say, I told you there was no God. I told you God doesn't, you know, answer prayers. You have to show him that you believe along the way. And even if he hadn't answered your prayers, you still need to show by your action. That you're not upset and you know that God will answer your prayers, or maybe it's not this time. Not you know, the time. All the stuff that you were taught, you have to show that person, but you don't do anything different. You can't talk, like Regina said, you can't talk a person into believing in God. Jesus couldn't even do that. He talked to those Pharisees. How many times do we read the Pharisees talk to them? How many times are we going to read that they try to catch him up in some kind of trap about the, the, the law, about scripture, or whatever? They taught, but Jesus gave them parable after parable, and they still did not believe. They still wanted to kill him. He had to heal people and all of that for people to begin to believe. And, and they didn't, and they still did. And even then, they didn't. <laughs> right, even then, they well, didn't. Some of them, I think his following increased, but you know, there were still others who didn't believe, but what you just said is very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, there are people, uh, because you go to church every Sunday and you know it, before there's a, a, even you know, if you watch Mass every Sunday, I'm just putting it out there like that. No matter what you do, they are going to watch you. You know, even when you yeah. say, if you sit and say a bad word, oh. they are going to say something about that. There is something that they are going to say about, because it's not about you. It's about them. And when they say something, let me tell you what happened when other people are saying something. They are questioning. They want to believe. I do believe they want to believe, but they're questioning. And who just read that about doubt? Was that Kathleen? You read about doubt? Yes. And, and doubt can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Doubt can push you to believing and doubt can push you away. But when they are doubting you because you said something to them and made a wrong step because now they got you on a pedestal. I've been on that pedestal too. They got you on a pedestal. She goes to church every day. Um, every time we get in a group, watch Sunday. Every time we get in a large group, everybody wants me to pray. I said, I said <laughs> time, everybody can pray. Anybody can pray. It doesn't have to be me. You understand? You all understand. It doesn't have to be me. It can be any one of them. Oh no, no, I can pray because you've been to church. You know, you know, my daughter, my youngest daughter prays much better than I do. She mm. comes out naturally. She has one of them natural prayers. It comes out of her, you know? Every now and then she gets this little thing she don't want to pray. And everybody, th- and then everybody looks at me like, you go to church every Sunday. You have Bible study. You should know how to pray. You should pray for us, you know? <laughs> and that's a good thing, but also it's questioning. They're questioning me, you know? And that's what they do to you. You are going to be watched and questioned, but there's a doubt in them. It makes them, they doubt that they can be good enough for God to pray. You understand? They are doubting yeah. themselves. That you know, and trying to figure out what God wants. Them. And the same thing with us. We're trying to figure out what God wants. For, what does God want me to do? Why does he keep wanting me to do this? You know, why does he keep wanting me to do things I don't want to do? And that's what God does to you too. That's another thing he does. He does, he does things to you that you don't want to do. And it pushes you in directions that you're uncomfortable with. You know, you don't want to do this, but next thing you know, you're standing up there doing this. You know, you're standing up there in front of people like I do sometimes I'm lecturing. You're standing up there going, why am I standing up here? 
<laughs> God wants you to do that. He made me feel uncomfortable. Exactly. Even, I kind of though. align. I I think about what all of you guys said. I kind of align the doubt with, and which we've all done, and sometimes we still do struggle with your faith. And people, to me, when if I am in a conversation, I can feel that somebody is struggling with their faith, but it's okay. It's okay because that's normal. And it is part of like Kathleen is saying, you grow when you have, when, when you experience these doubts and you begin to ask these questions, as you learn the answers to these questions, you deepen your faith. And I know that when I think about being a kindergarten teacher at, at one time, what what do children do? They you you put them in a in, in situations, especially like science, where they embrace curiosity. That's what children do. That's what they do when they don't know. They have to explore. They have to, you have to give them proof. You you have to let them embrace uh, the curiosity. And so they, and then what do you have them to do? They break out in groups with each other and what do they do? Um, I, I honestly, I don't have an answer to that question, but I want to make a correction. I said it was in the book of Ephesians, but it was in the book of Romans chapter 12 that I, and and I've it, used words only when absolutely necessary. Right. They have to keep asking questions in order to try and get the answers. And that's what we do in Bible study. We read, we talk to each other. We ask the questions to help us to try and get the answers. Of course, we never fully will, but mm -hmm. we'll never prove that God exists. And that's okay for me. <laughs> Um, I don't, I, I never physically have seen them on this earth. I can't tell you that, but it's a spirit that I have, um, that tells me that he's, he exists. And that's the faith that I have, um, to go on. So the only thing I can tell someone else is to, is to keep seeking him. Um, even if you're not totally sure that you believe in him, just mm -hmm. keep learning about it and maybe like my own self and I don't know when this happened that uh my face opened up and I I don't have those doubts like I encounter with with other people um mm -hmm. I said to someone once um I don't know what the situation was I, I'm not gonna get into that but I said you know God didn't make it to be. It wasn't meant to be. And the person's response was, oh, here we go again. We're believing in that, <laughs> believing in that God stuff. It wasn't meant to be. But to me and my spirit, when things happen, I try to, I try very hard not to look at things as failures. I try to look at things as opportunities. And it wasn't meant to be. I know God has other plans for me. That's how I look at things. But that's not everybody's faith that I encounter. But I said it very lightly because that's my spirit. But mm. the other person didn't take it lightly. But that doesn't change my spirit. It's just that person is not where I am mentally. Mm. So the only thing I can do is say... Um, just like we're doing now, we're taking our time and we're letting ourselves work through this at our own pace. And I appreciate something my sister said to that, that now that she is embracing Bible study, uh, my job is done. <laughs> you know, I, something as well. I kill me when people say that their job is done. 
You ain't dead till you die. So I know that. Die. I know that. I'm kidding with my sister. I know that. <laughs> Can I add something as well? I wanted to say something, Michael. So, well, there was a lot of good commentary, and, and I love it. And just adding on, sometimes, one, if it, it depends if, if we're approaching a person and talking about our faith or a person approaches us with the curiosity or questioning of their faith. So sometimes we have to be aware that if, if God will, will make a way, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting discernment in my head, but you can tell when a person is searching yeah. Right. Yep. And so God will set up that conversation if you discern in that person's spirit that they're searching, yep. and then that opens the door for you yep. to share. Yes. Now, if you are approaching a person thinking that I'm wondering where their faith is, well, you don't know unless they tell you, right? And sometimes some of us, not those of us here on this call. <laughs> But we have a tendency to want to proselytize people or jump on them and, you know, you need God, you need God because you perceive them in a certain way or their behaviors a certain way and you need this and you need that. But that might be the thing that drives them away, right? And so, D, I've been in this, I've been in those situations where, you know, they, yeah, you, he's a spiritual person. Michael goes to church yeah. and in a circle, you yeah. pray, you pray. And I'm like, God puts prayer in all of us. That's right. You're just speaking, you're speaking that which is on your mind, which your spirit is right now. Right. It's, there's no fashion, shape, or form of prayer. Your prayer is yours, right? Yeah. But People like to hide behind it, but it's up to us to discern those certain things. Now, sometimes when I talk to people, because people will look at you and put you under that magnifying glass. And I'm, I'm telling them too, that I trip up as well, but I know that I'm to confess my sin or my shortcoming to God. And I believe that he will forgive me. That's the difference. So no matter how you look at me through that magnifying glass, only to to appease, you know, y'all Christians is this and y'all Christians is that. See, you stumble. But I know I can go to the Father and confess that sin. Yeah. Where are you at? Right. So so we shouldn't feel that pressure that someone puts us under a magnifying glass because we're a Christian. Or they want to see you that way because then <clears throat> once you tell them that, <clears throat> they look for perfection. And we know that Jesus is the only perfect man. So for me, I understand that if the person I'm talking to doesn't, that's on him. Because you're not yeah. going to put any added pressure on me because you're putting me under a microscope or a magnifying glass. Because I know who I am. I know the God that I serve. So... So part of that could be the shaking the dust off your feet. You know what I mean? I'm not, gonna, <clears throat> I'm not gonna get into a debate with somebody who's gonna keep trying to prove my, my belief system or not, right? We ain't gonna have that argument because you're, you're coming from that place of the antichrist. That's the way I'm looking at you. If you're gonna be persistent in that certain argument, there's, there's a thing where I can probably tell if you're curious or if you're a Christian bashing, right? Okay. And we're yeah. looking for we're looking for that opening to stick the spear in you, so to speak, to kill the Christian, right? So, so we have to discern that when we are approached by people or when we are approaching people, right? So, so you know. We got to know, well, as they say, know when to hold them and know when to fold them and know when to walk away. That's that, is so, that is so true, Michael. And I think that one of the best perfect. ways to do that instead of trying to talk over people is just to listen. Bingo. Yes. Um, I want to, uh, 
no, if it's Gretchen or Valerie, do you have any comments on any of this? Because I see you are not saying anything today. So I'm opening it up to you all. Uh, Jennifer, do you, do you have anything you want to say? No, I, I agree with everything that was said. Um, you know, I guess the best way to do is to convince, you know, to, to lead by example. Um, and knowing that, yeah, we are, um, we're capable of making mistakes just like everybody else. You know, just like the song says, we're going to fall down, but we got to get back. We get back up. Yeah. Um, that, that I love that song. Um, uh, Regina, can you look up, uh, uh, has an asterisk on um, 28. I, I want to talk about 28. And they have an ash uh, and a cue beside it. Regina? 28. Yes. When, when he says, my Lord and my God. Valerie, uh, Gretchen, you are, are you there? I am here and <laughs> I am listening and being enlightened. I mean, you know. My Lord and my God, this forms a literary inclusion with the first verse of the gospel. And the word was God. Is that what you wanted? Yeah, that's what is, is that what the asterisk says there? On 2028. Yeah. Sonia. Yeah. Read it again. I, I'm just confused about it. Read it again. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Okay, there it is. The verse, him saying, My Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Forms a literary inclusion, inclusion. With, with the, the first, first verse of the gospel. Of the gospel. And the word was God. That was the first verse. The word yeah. was God. God. Right. So is, yeah. is it telling us that uh, Thomas was the was the first one that, that really said that, called him my Lord and my God? I don't think so. It's just saying he made reference to the word is God. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it wow. also, also to me, this, this is what, uh, John's story is about for me. Um, it's, uh, we're talking about 28. So that's, this is what John's whole story is for me. What Thomas, Thomas formed the whole, this is the whole climax of John's story for me. It's the purpose why John wrote the gospel is so that we all may have, you know, that we all may have life. So to me, this sums up all the, everything that I've learned in the book of John. Mm -hmm. um, can, I, can I relate that to the discussion that preceded the um, examination yes. of this? Yes. I, if you can consider yourselves and my, and I consider myself to be blessed because we have not necessarily seen Jesus physically. Right. But we believe, you know, because of other manifestations that he has in our lives, like some of the things that we prayed for, some of the miracles that have happened. And then in just the small joys that we tally up and what we're thankful for, we believe that that Jesus is with us and, and our God is all knowing and he loves us and takes care of us. Mm -hmm. So I think that we could say we belong to those that are blessed who have not seen, maybe we haven't seen them, we didn't put our fingers in the side, but we believe. Yes. And, and I was gonna say that um, when you asked for us, me to, and Miss um, Bourne to say something, that I've been studying a long, long time. <laughs> I'm an old lady, but I, did a lot of study with the Protestants. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, most of their, as Father Mill, mm, Father Mill, woo -hoo, as Father Rich has told us, is that they believe more hear so that in the word. Most of us, what? I, did, I missed that word. Most. I said, most of the Protestants believe that the, the word is enough. Yeah. Okay. As Catholics, we believe in the traditions that we have, in, including the word. So yeah. I take a lot of the word because of how I, I trained myself in studying the Bible with the with a lot of Protestants, that it's it's kind of literal. Now, everything may not be, 
you know, there's a little bit of, um, what do you call it? Controversy. Yeah, controversy about certain verses and stories in the Bible. You know, you got to take, but there's enough truth in it for me that I believe that these are the words of God that he wants us to know. And that's enough because they have, it has proven itself to me. Right. So I don't, um, you know, of course you have minutes of doubt or say, well, what, I wonder why um, St. Paul wrote that. That doesn't, that's kind of contradictory, but right. then you kind of, you go with, okay, but all the other stuff, you look at the, the lady, what is that? Lady Justice and the scales being balanced. Oh, and you, yeah. Or you think about um, the good things in your life and the bad things in your life. Well, the good things way outweigh the bad things, <laughs> you know? And all of the miracles that have occurred way outweigh the, your doubts. So I go with the word. I go with the word. I mean, I'm a Catholic. I've been a Catholic all my life. And I believe in the Catholic church. But, I, but this believing in the word and what it says and um not doubting it so much you know doubt does come in mm -hmm. but i kind of try to stay away from it and say well what does the bible say what does god say that's how i kind of keep myself in line you know so that doubt doesn't overtake and doesn't waver my faith yeah, I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> yeah, it's good doubt because it makes you go back. And you, I just heard that when you do a doubt, you go back and you look in the word. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't want to stop you, uh, not enough for talking, but I, I do want to make sure oh, we this chapter before we, uh, so we had it one page next week. But I did want to say that when Thomas said, My Lord, my God, he was putting Jesus in the place where he is both. He is telling him that he is God. He does, now he does believe that he is a God. You know, that he is one, he's that one person that put that trinity together. And I think that when uh, that quote was talking about it going back to the first, at the beginning, Jesus was at the beginning, but he also was, God was at the beginning. So I'm, I'm thinking that Thomas has finally put it together what no one else has said. Yeah, they believed, but no one has said this particular thing. I think it's important for us to put that out there because we know who wrote this. We know who said this, whose gospel it is. It's the gospel of John. And John doesn't do anything, as we learn, uh, without a purpose. Everything he writes is for us to look at and try to understand why did he put this particular sentence there? My Lord and my God. He is now finally getting it. He finally says that Jesus is in the Trinity. He has really put that together. And he is helping us. And I think when the scripture said, helping us see, um, you know, where the, uh, the Holy Spirit is, you know, where the Pentecost is happening. All of that is just to me in this one little verse right here. Um, and Gretchen also said, uh, blessed are those who haven't seen and believed. You all have said this. We are blessed because we heard the word from someone else. And I heard it when I was a little girl. And I believe when I was a little girl. So when you are that young and, you know, and believe it, I'm amazed. I get a fall. I mean, I, I just totally amazed when children grab, grab this. They got this. You heard it. They sing it. They say it. And, you know, and they pray it. When they, you see them get this, it's an awesome sight to behold. But I'm just saying that Gretchen and all of you all said, the main point, point of this whole thing is, blessed are those who have seen and have not and have believed. That's us. Mm -hmm. That's all of us. We are blessed because we haven't seen him physically, but we still believe that he exists. We have seen him in our lives. We have seen him work things out in our lives. That's why I put that question out there. You have seen him in your life. You have known that he has worked things out. And you know he put you in places where you didn't want to go, but he put yeah. you here. And you know he does that. And you know, we need to sit back sometime and realize what he's done. I've done that too. At the end of the day, they asked us to do that. We, you know, we asked kids to do that. Write down how your day was going. My, my daughter does that, my oldest daughter. She, she writes in her diary what 
going on that day. But she said sometimes when she writes in her diary, she can feel the Holy Spirit and, you know, talking to her. She said she can feel the Holy Spirit talking to her as she writes down what had happened during the day. And sometimes I have to, to put all the pieces together and you won't be as upset. You won't have the, and Gretchen mentioned, the good days outweigh the bad days. And if you think about it, you won't have any bad days. My mother always says, you know, she has a bad day because she wakes up every day. And if you, if, and I have to say this, I'm going to give this to her and she knows she's listening. But when she, every day I call her and every day there's not, there's not a day she's not sounding all joyful. She's 88. She said, you she don't worry about it. She is, she sounds joyful every single day when I call her. That is my wake up pill every day. Oh, she calls me. I mean, every day she says she's blessed. Every day she wakes up, she's blessed. No matter what's happening, she's going to be blessed. And that's the way we need to take it. You know, we don't have to wait till we get 88 to take it, but she was doing this before. You know, she's just, it's just amazing when I call her up and she says that. And I, I, you know, I just want to end it with that, but I do want to go, we got five minutes to read 30 and 31. Kathleen, was you reading earlier? You want to uh, yeah. You want me to keep yeah, going? Yeah, let's conclude this, yes. Okay. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief, you may have life in his name. All right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Many, and you know, I, I, I know that I want to conclude with this that everything we need is in this book. This is Gretchen says. Yeah. And I think yeah. This is a whole important part. Everything. But especially for those who for doubt and don't believe, is the part that is why he had the crucifixion. Crucifixion is in here, tell us everything. We have been, the man has been betrayed, he's been bit. He's been beaten. He's been spit upon. He's been everything. You know, I can't even watch the movie The Passion of Christ. It's too vivid. It makes me. It hurts me every time. They, I know. It hurts. And I tried to go through it. I didn't even watch it this year. I normally watch it every year. I didn't I, watch it. This I, I gave up watching that. That was too brutal. I, I, I gave up watching that. But it's something we need to see. I, I have to say that because we yeah. need to see the real thing and what really, really, really happens. Uh, you know, doing that. He, he, his best friends walked away from him. All the disciples walked away from him. Mm -hmm. You got, you got the people that, uh, that, uh, they cried. I mean, I'm hanging around with these people all my life. Three years I'm hanging around with these people. I get in trouble. They start to run. What kind of friends are they? <laughs> we have it's, it's the same thing. He, he's, he's been betrayed. And then he comes back and he forgives these betrayers. If he will kill him, his friends who walk away, he forgives all of them. He comes back in this Thomas thing, and he forgives Thomas. He comes to see his friends, and even though most of them ran away from him, I'm mean, not saying all, but we know the Mary Magdalene, the mother, the women, some of them stayed at the cross. But all these man. brave men, the brave men left him. His brothers left him. Mm -hmm. this, this crucifixion comes to tell us that. Everything that we know in here. And the main purpose is this whole thing is love. Yeah. Of all of them and he forgave. So if yeah. you know, people and how many you, and how many times does the Bible tell us to forgive? Well, how many times it takes? It, 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 it 70 plus, but how many whatever time it takes is for us to forgive a person. So he's telling us everything we need to know in this crucifixion. Everything we need to know. So, you know, if, you, if you're struggling with how to forgive someone, it's right here. If you're struggling how to love someone, it's right here. We are imperfect people, and Jesus know that. He knew it was perfect, imperfect, and he called all the perfect people to be his friends. All mm -hmm. the he knew was imperfect, he called them to be his friends. Gretchen. Yeah, and I add this so little piece in there. Forgive, he said, Forgive 70 times seven is the phrase that Jesus used to teach his followers to forgive others repeatedly and generously, which is 100 and 
Four minutes. 70. 70, oh, 70 right. times 70. Times seven. 70. So I have people. So, no, I 70 people. times seven. You know, I have some people in your life that you don't want to forgive these people. But I'm telling mm -hmm. you, it's well, yeah, how hard it hurts you. You have to forgive them. And I think Michael and Gretchen, I think you both wanted to say something. And we can yeah, end I, I wanted to no. say that to add on to what um, Gretchen was saying, you know, uh, how um, you you um, Bible study with Protestants, and sometimes it gets a little challenging mm. as far as interpreting the scripture. But uh, these settings are good, mm. and it's good that we have Father Rich <clears throat> or for Bible studies that have a resource person that that has say a, a background in theology and that sort of thing because. It helps us in how we understand the Bible, how we approach the Bible, because we can take it literally, but then there's so much in the Bible that if we if we don't understand how some things are written, then it might throws us, it might throw us off in how we're reading it. Right. So yes, there are times where I'm reading or we could be reading. It depends where your spirit at. What, then what are you going into the Bible looking for? You could find that one piece of scripture that answers <clears throat> that answers that spirit that you're in, excuse me, that you're in right then and there, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's, I think Father Rich even mentioned sometimes we have to look at the Bible like it's a library, right? It is. And, and if that's not explained to us and we only take it literally, sometimes it can throw our belief system off because you might read one thing over here and then something else that contradicts that. And then I'm in a quandary because now I really don't know, I've become conflicted. So yes. it's, it's good that we, we have a, a Bible study, not just this one, but any of them, but to have a good resource person to help us understand the journey when we go into the word. Yes. And, and let me add to my um, discourse, <laughs> that the reason that I had been studying for like 40 years since my children were going to Arlington mm -hmm. is because that, this type of in-depth study was not offered at the Catholic church. That's right. You know, oh, I was going to say right. Bernadine for 42 years. Yeah. Okay. Except for, I remember a couple of times, Father Miller tried a Bible study, but it was just, it was just so washed, not to say washed over. He just went through 20 books a, at each session and so mm -hmm. you know we didn't go in depth mm -hmm. so i'm sure that like i think um loretta said that there are other places that are, are doing it now catholics um churches that yes. we're doing it now but i just felt the need way back then that i needed some in-depth study so right. that's why mm -hmm. i that's why i did it but i'm glad, glad i'm glad we caught up because my, my father he didn't know anything about the Catholic Church. I mean, he was a Catholic. He didn't know anything about the Bible. I could teach my parents stuff about the Bible. And they were Catholic. They didn't know anything. You right. know, so they were good Catholics too. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, I mean <laughs> something I as simple that I love something being Catholic. As simple I'm not that born in the have to start. You don't have to start um from the beginning of the Bible. Like I thought. Many years ago, I had to start from the beginning in order to understand the mm -hmm. end. And no one ever explained to me any different that I could read the New Testament and not do the Old Testament. I always, and then that was a problem because I couldn't get through the Old Testament. <laughs> I couldn't get okay. Through it. okay, so just to wrap this up, our main objective is to know and understand who Jesus Christ is in our life. And sometimes that brings us back to the Old Testament. But your main purpose is about Jesus Christ. And um, Gretchen is right, because um, when I started youth ministry, um, Gretchen, there was no material out for them. I had to take the white material, and, and most of it was Protestant, and change the, the scenario so that my kids could understand. And, you know, that was like 20 years ago and when I got started. Because there was no, um, when they did scripture, they were white kids doing stuff in white neighborhoods that kids didn't do. So I had to change the wording so that they could understand. You know, they got stuff out now. And I remember when they put out the, the Catholic Church put out the school, the, the children's Bible, 
I was one of the persons that came to and asked me, you know, does this look okay? And I still got the samples that they, they sent me because we did not have a Bible for children. We do have it now. Now, now it's getting a lot better than it used to be. But I understand you, Gretchen. You had to go where the need took you. But guess what? The need never took you away from this church. And the need <laughs> still brought you back to this church. And the need also helped you teach your parents what Jesus wanted. And that is very good. God did this. You understand? You think you did it. But God did this. He put in those places so that you understand and take it back. You know, you go places, you think you go places on your own, but that's not true. You, <laughs> you look at it and you said, not true. God directs your life. Right. He directs yes, your yes. life and he'll direct you to stay there. Is that what he needs you to do? Well, he'll direct, direct you to come back if that's what he needs you to do. I believe he directed me to be here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be married to this Catholic boy who brought me to this church in the first place. <laughs> and that's how I got here. I married a Catholic boy who said he was going to get married in the church. I said, fine with me. I wasn't practicing my religion as much as his mother thought it was important for us to get married in this church. And next thing you know, I'm doing more than his whole family. The thing is, Gretchen, I had to be like you. I had to teach his Catholic family something about their Bible that they didn't know. And yeah. they come to me and ask me stuff about the Catholic Church to do that they didn't know. You yeah. know what I mean? So God put you in places that you don't think you're supposed to be. But mm -hmm. God has a way of making everything work out. And, and that's why he used imperfect people. If we look at the Bible, these are imperfect people that he uses. I mean, the people that society says that you are not worth two cents. Yeah. God, and, and, I, and I want you to go back to the Bible because God says, Everyone's important. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to have a crown head. Everybody is important. Everybody that he made has something that he needs us to do. And the only thing he needs us to do is spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That's all he needs to do. Spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we Amen. don't, hey guys, I have to. I have to go. Yeah, we need to talk to you later. If all we right. don't, yeah, we don't. See you have later. To. Bye bye. We know that we don't have the mission that Jesus put us on this earth to do. Spread the good news, Garnetta, Loretta. I absolutely <laughs> will. Thank you. Keep chasing after him as well. Keep seeking him. That's right. In everything. They say pray to St. Anthony. Praise to Jesus. He'll find.